Hey guys, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, today we're going to have a, a session about a customer story where Thomson Reuters has deployed Manila. And just share with you some of the things that uh, you know, they did, what they were looking to do, and how that came together. And talk a little bit about Manila. Who here is familiar with Manila? Anyone? Everyone? A lot of people? Okay, so when we talk about Manila, I won't go into a whole lot of detail, but provide you some of the key points and key concepts about it. But uh, so, uh, quick agenda. Again, uh, Justin is from Thomson Reuters. I'm Greg Lockmiller. Uh, I'm with NetApp. I'm a technical marketing engineer, and I've been with NetApp for nine years, working in various roles from uh, uh, application space to storage space. So, you know, and my career has taken me from architecture to rack and stack and doing storage designs uh, to building out NetApp gear to working with customers to do uh, what do they want to do, you know, sit with and listen and interpret and build out design. So, what we want to talk about today, just real quick, the challenges that Thomson Reuters encountered when they were you know, going to the private cloud and specifically around their NAS investment and what they did with NFS and NAS and how they wanted to manage to that within their private cloud, what they were looking to for object, you know, the objectives of that cloud and the requirements. So they didn't, you know, Justin will talk to it, I don't want to steal his thunder, but they had some very specific requirements and objectives that they wanted to accomplish in bringing in the NAS uh, part into their private cloud with OpenStack. I'll talk a little bit about what Manila is, and then uh, turn it back over to Justin. He'll talk about some of the benefits and things that occurred for them and how it worked well for uh, Thomson Reuters. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Justin right now, and he can you know, introduce himself and tell us a little bit about what, uh, Thompson, who Thomson Reuters is. All right, well, uh, thank you, Greg. So uh, first, um, you know, how many of you have heard of Thomson Reuters? So yeah, it looks like a lot of hands. So this is just something I took from our website. Thomson Reuters, the world's leading source of intelligent information for business and professionals. So we serve a number of industries. We serve the finance industry, the legal industry, the tax inf industry, and it's about providing information to those, those businesses through a lot of software products that, uh, that we've written. And so we've been looking at kind of what's kind of happening out there with, with OpenStack, with cloud, so that we can uh, continue to deliver those uh, products for our, uh, our businesses. Um, as Greg already said, I'm Justin Detman. I'm an infrastructure architect with uh, Thomson Reuters. I've been uh, dabbling with OpenStack for uh, for about two years, and uh, we've had a uh, deployment which we have uh, users on that are building the products to deliver to our customers for almost uh, almost a year. So, oops, I'm it, sorry. No, it's okay. So, <laughs> Justin, tell us a little bit about the challenges that you guys were trying to solve. What was what were some of the challenges around as you worked with uh, within the IT organization, providing benefits to your business units, you know, and, and specifically around you know the OpenStack, the private cloud, and NAS. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks, Greg. So, uh, you know, as I already mentioned, we've got a we've got an OpenStack cloud, and even before that, we'd been uh, been using a different uh, cloud platform, and uh, we've been uh, enabling our business units to uh, to more quickly um, do t development, do testing, to get the products out there for their uh, their end customers, but. Uh, one of, the, one of the challenges that we've had, and I think a lot, of, a lot of enterprises have, is how do you give the customers or your business units what they want in the time frame in which they want it? So we had looked to, uh, to cloud to, uh, to help solve that for us by building an uh, internal uh, private cloud. We're able to spin up compute instances, provide the, the customers with the storage they need, provide them with the networking they need, but there's still some... Uh, some gaps that, uh, that we have in that space. So specifically what we're going to be talking today to is, uh, is about uh, Manila and uh, essentially NAS as a service. So we have a pretty sizable investment in, uh, in using um, NAS storage in our environment. A lot of our business units are accustomed to be able to, to share files across compute instances seamlessly. And that was one of the gaps that we had in our, in our private cloud deployment. And so that and a number of other things, we're constantly looking at how do we bring in some of these other services that we traditionally provide in, uh, in our data center to become more self-service so that the customers are able to provision those resources as they, uh, as they need. As, as we're looking at this, this just becomes one of the tools that the business units have in order to be able to more quickly do, uh, do development and testing and really get their products out there in front of their, uh, their customers who are the ones who ultimately pay us money. So in terms of the challenges, what, um, you know, what type of objectives did you need for this solution? What, what were some of the key things and requirements and objectives that you guys really wanted to have 
that would help you guys out? So I, I think one of, the, one of the challenges I see as an enterprise when I start bringing in OpenStack or any new technology is it's, it's bringing in a lot of new things to, to groups that uh, you know, are accustomed to supporting the infrastructure that we already have. And uh, in looking at bringing in the, uh, the NAS as a service, one of the things we wanted to do was uh, reuse the sizable investment that we already had in our, in our NAS infrastructure. So we wanted to be able to, to self-service or provision NAS for customers, essentially, when they needed it. But we didn't want to bring in anything that was substantially different than, uh, than what we were, we were already accustomed to, uh, to running from. So what we ended up doing is uh, we ended up uh, you know, looking kind of out at what's out there, worked with, with NetApp a little bit, and uh, figured out, OK, how can we reuse some of the knowledge that we already have using uh, the NetApp Workflow Automator, which is essentially a, a provisioning tool to, uh, to provision on, uh, on NetApp filers, but make it such that we can really decouple that interaction between the end customer and the end result, so that we're able to leverage the, the identity within Keystone, we're able to set quotas, we're able to allow the users to use that, that well-defined interface into Manila with standard APIs and really decouple it from the, the underlying infrastructure that they're, uh, they're already uh, provisioned, or they, they want to be able to provision. That way there's, there's um, the identity pieces, the permissioning, we didn't have to worry about how to deal with that. OpenStack cake takes care of that, but we're able to, behind the scenes, look at using some of the infrastructure that we already had on the floor to do the provisioning. Awesome. So with, with their integration, they use Manila, and they also use WFA, so what I'd like to do is share a little bit about what Manila is. And, but first, uh, how many people here have NFS within their infrastructure, you know, outside of the cloud? Who uses NFS? And, and, and the, a lot of talks that we give and a lot of presentations and customers that I go to, it, they always say, well, I got all this NFS and, and SIFs, and I'd like to bring that into the private cloud. And one of the things that, if you notice here, it, the IDC did a, stu a survey or study back in 2012, and I know, you know, that's ancient in terms of, uh, you know, technology. You know, it's probably a generation old to us, so to speak, being at 2012. But 65% of the storage delivered and sold in their survey was for file shares. And so that was one of the key factors that kind of drove uh, the community to say, y you know, OpenStack technical community, we need this. And they agreed, and so thus started Manila. So that was kind of the beginnings of Manila and, and how it came to bear. So a little bit more about Manila, you know, what is it? It's, you think of what Cinder is to block storage for OpenStack. Manila is for file shares to OpenStack. It is in an incubated, uh, well, in previous terminology, it was an incubated project uh, as of August of 2014. But it provides exactly to what Justin was saying, some multi-tenant secure file share services where an end user can have quotas, can create their own NFS shares, be it, uh, or SIFs, and provide dif uh, different access uh, abilities to those devices, to those file systems, rather. And it allows those shares to be available to the VM or bare metal. And we've talked to a few folks that wanted to uh, use OpenStack to provision it, provide access to it, and they'll have bare metal environments that will mount those NFS or SIF shares up. So that's what Manila is. It, again, it's, it's NFS and SIFs. It provides the ability for multi-tenant and secure sharing activities. So a few key concepts. Um, I find that sometimes when we talk about Manila, you know, we throw some new terms out there that may not be familiar, so I'll, I'll be brief here. But as you guys learn more about Manila or hear more about it or start using it, think about a share as a, that is the NFS entity or a SIFS entity, right? It can be uh, provisioned on any storage, right? Just whatever driver is supported with Manila, and we'll talk about that later, and it'll create that particular object on the storage. So here, you know, for us at NetApp, that's a FlexVol, and it creates a FlexVol on the storage, and then it provides that share, and you create an export policy for that, for the VM or the bare metal. You can also define who has access to it. And so with, with NFS, you can do it with a CIDR format or a specific IP, as well as you can deny access to. So maybe I create a share, and I don't want Justin's box to see it, so I can deny access to that, but maybe open it up to a range within a CIDR format as well. So you've got the security of who can, ex who can actually mount or provide that uh, share to their host. And then finally, it's a share network. Initially with Manila, it was focused on with Neutron, and we're going to talk a little bit later in a couple of slides 
about some of the changes in Kilo around Manila and what it can do from a network perspective. But it creates a shared network. It's based upon Neutron for some of the earlier releases, and it still uses Neutron, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the deployment options later. But effectively, what you can do is define a Neutron network, provide that as a shared network within Manila, and then that layer two, layer three connectivity is provided that way, and then you have, a, again, another multi-layer security for those shares within the networking space. So um, also within Manila, you can provide security services. And so when I talk about that, think about SIFS, LDAP, things like that. So if on my SIFS protocol, uh, I can do LDAP and provide access rules that way by user accounts, as well as if uh, Kiberos, if you wanted to use Kiberos or things like that. So there's some other types of security services available as well with uh, Manila. And then snapshots, uh, just like Cinder, Manila has snapshots. And what we do with the snapshots with the NetApp driver is a net, uh, a Manila snapshot creates a NetApp snapshot. And so for those that are familiar with the NetApp storage, it, it's a snapshot on the storage. And as well as other drivers, it's all comparable to what they do within their storage and their infrastructure. So you have the capability of creating snapshots and creating shares from snapshots too. And then finally, uh, real quick, a back end. Very much, it's a provider of the shares. Think of it as an NFS server that's providing up um, the capability or storage providing uh, capability to an NFS server. Uh, those shares can reside on a single backend, or you can have multiple backends defined there too. And then finally, the driver. Uh, multiple drivers are out there now. Kilo, uh, with the release of Kilo, we saw nine additional drivers as part of the stable Kilo branch. So, and we'll share, with those, share those with you real quick too. Uh, so these are some of the drivers. Initially, back for the past couple of years, you were able, you know, since Icehouse, you know, to pull down Manila and you'd have an EMC driver, a NetApp driver, as well as a Gluster FS driver. But with the release of Kilo this past April, end of April and May, these are all the additional drivers you can get. I mean, the Oracle ZFS storage appliance, HDS. Uh, HDFS, I thought that was kind of, so a Hadoop file system is available too. GPFS from IBM, HP for some of their NAS devices, and a couple of others that you can see here. So again, it's growing. Uh, a lot of companies and a lot of individuals are contributing as well as writing drivers for NAS devices. And I think what really brings um, credibility to the use of NFS within the cloud is, has anybody heard what AWS has announced over the past month, you know, past few weeks? Has anybody heard of the EFS? So AWS has came out and said, hey, gosh, you know, we've got an, elas an elastic file system. So they saw the need for NFS within the AWS cloud. So again, Manila's been around for two years, and, and we went to the technical community as a community and said, you know, there's a need. There's a business and technical gap there. So again, then you can see that adds credibility to that with all the drivers that's been brought forward in the past six months. So real quick, um, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, a brief architecture, logical architecture, and hand it back over to Justin about their solution. So, just like Cinder, for the most part, Manila is absolutely not in the data path. And you have an API server, so if you want to integrate with it, you most certainly can integrate with the Manila APIs. You don't have to use a horizon. You don't have to use the command line. Uh, there is integration, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, what we did for the solution for Thomson Reuters. So then you have the scheduler. He's going to decide, where do I want to place it at? You have multiple backends. You can have pools of storage, and you can weight that, as well as you can have... Uh, Share types, just like in Cinder, you have volume types. In Manila, you have share types, you have extra specs, and you can define some criteria and attributes about where you want the scheduler to place things. And then obviously, finally, you have the Manila shares, and so based on your drivers and how you configure your manila.conf, that's the share process. So what I'd like to do now, again, just real brief, not a, not a whole, lot, the, whole lot of time there, but I want to turn it back over to Justin and talk a little bit about their solution. Let him share with us about the solution and, and what was the best fit for Thomson Reuters, how they use Manila, how they use WFA. All right, thanks, Rick. So, uh, you know, kind of looking at, uh, at what we did for, uh, for our environment, we got some, uh, some graphics up there. We can see the, the, the OpenStack deployment is represented by that little cloud on the, the left-hand side with uh, the Manila service running in there. Uh, that's kind of the, the standard OpenStack pieces. That's the, uh, the user interaction with uh, the, uh, the share service. The, uh, the Manila service is then using a, uh, a REST API to call into the, uh, um, the NetApp uh, workflow automator 
which then actually orchestrates the uh, the share creation on our uh, on our NetApp filers. I think the the really cool thing when you look at this picture, though, is when you look at it from on the the right hand side where we've got WFA and you've got the filers. That's the sphere of traditional IT. So that's where you would usually have a storage admin or uh, someone else in the data center organization actually doing that uh, that provisioning work. There, there's no mechanism to easily you know, expose that to, to my end users through a standard interface. And, and the beauty of all this is mm -hmm. we're able to take, uh, take the OpenStack um, tenant and uh, users that we already have for all of our other, uh, our other services, identify the user through Keystone, through uh, quotas within Manila, be able to permission the, uh, the tenants to do a certain amount of, uh, of shares with a certain amount of gigabytes. And through that standard OpenStack interface, through the Manila service, they're able to make an API call, which then <clears throat> gets translated to that, through that driver to that underlying infrastructure to actually call out to WFA. And the end result is they end up with a, uh, a volume that's created on the, uh, on the uh, filer that they're able to then do other operations through the Manila service on. So they're able to say they want to um, create a snapshot, say they want to be able to permission it to all their VMs. Um, I think this provides a, a ton of flexibility, and it makes the, uh, the end users a lot more empowered to be able to, to get what they need very quickly. We've seen a lot of challenges that uh, we've got split infrastructure between what we've do, done in our traditional space and what we've done in our, uh, in our OpenStack uh, cloud. And uh, when I look at what we have in our, in our OpenStack cloud, users have gotten accustomed to be able to self-service and provision things. And as we talked about earlier, we kind of had a gap in being able to self-provision their NAS or even be able to, to permission their NAS. Now, through this, uh, through this interface, through the Manila API, the users are able to create a NAS. They're able to then permission their NAS to their VMs. They're able to remove the permission if they want. Um, they, we've given them the, the control where they typically would have, if they wanted to get a, a cloud resource accessing one of the NASs that was uh, managed by the data center, they might have to wait uh, wait a period of time, a couple days maybe, to, uh, to get permission, whereas now they can essentially have that in, uh, in minutes. Um, so this is really, I think this is really exciting for our organization. We're very, we use, a, we use a lot of NAS, and we've got a lot of business units that have built applications where they expect to have a, uh, a shared, uh, shared file system. And early on, as we started working on uh, um, our initial cloud solution that we did a couple years ago, and then more recently with OpenStack, that's always been a question of where, where's the, the NAS? I need, uh, you've given me a VM, you've given me block storage, but I need this uh, shared storage. And through this solution, we're able to leverage what, uh, what we've already got on the, uh, the floor, but put a, uh, a self-service interface in front of it such that the users can, uh, can do what they need. So. So yeah, to, to add on to what Justin said, this particular solution, we have different modes of the driver. We have what we call a direct driver. So very traditionally, maybe what you would download off GitHub or get with your distribution, so a direct driver, which would communicate directly to uh, your storage array, whoever you use behind it, or if you want to do what they call the reference implementation, where it creates a VM and creates some storage made available. So that's the direct method. It talks directly to the storage. And this is an indirect method where we use WFA as a, an intermediary, uh, and, and primarily to Justin's point, they needed to re reuse and not reinvent. They had to be able to continue to use their investment in their tools as well as with what they had on the floor. So this felt like a nice fit, having an indirect method where they're familiar with WFA, they have a ton of investment and in development and deployment of it. Not everyone has that, right? But that's why I wanted to point out that this is one method, that's the indirect method, and it fit very well for Thomson Reuters and with the teams that, Tom, uh, that Justin works with. And then there's the direct method too, and I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit there. So you have, the, again, the direct and indirect uh, method. So like I said, direct provides simplicity. Um, and with Kilo, you've got some different capabilities there for deployments, be it with uh, multi-SVM or single SVM. And what that really means is I want to handle my uh, storage virtual machines through Manila, or I want to pre-configure a virtual machine for Manila to use. And that's all part of the direct. Uh, you can use the different network uh, plugins. I can be Neutron, Nova Network, or even standalone too. So those are a lot of the features that came out with Kilo that can make it flexible for when you want to deploy Manila, how do you want to do Manila within your infrastructure? You know, you know, I'm not up here trying to talk about what NetApp's done, but it's more about what the community done, has done for Manila because with the changes that the community do, has done with Manila for this driver in Kilo, 
uh, as a whole, it really provides flexibility with those direct drivers. Now, from a NetApp perspective, obviously, we have a, a Manila uh, C dot driver, cluster data on tap driver. Uh, we also have the WFA, the indirect driver. So if you do have uh, the use of WFA or their workflow automation, then you, you don't want to give that up and still use what you've architected for automation, then you have the capability of integrating that with OpenStack through REST API calls. So those are you know, some of the things. Again, you know, simplicity with direct and the flexibility with uh, WFA and kind of not re-architecting or redefining your standards and your architecture, so the ability to continue business as you're used to, but be able to insert this type of activity so you can still use the cloud within your infrastructure. So one more thing is really, you know, we've talked about, you know, the requirements, the objectives, and, and the challenges for Thomson Reuters, and Justin shared with us a lot of information there. But, you know, what I'd like for Justin to share with us, too, is, you know, what were the benefits? Okay, you kind of caught some of those benefits as we've talked, but, you know, what kind of things really provided a benefit for, the, for them and how it worked well for Thomson Reuters being able to go down that path, looking at the challenges, what the solution needed, and then finally doing an indirect driver and what that meant for their business. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the why Manila for, for OpenStack Clouds? I think, uh, I think the key thing when we, uh, when we look at uh, OpenStack within our organization is, I've heard this term used a lot this week, is the abstraction piece. So being able to, to take and uh, have a, uh, a service with a uh, well-defined set of APIs that uh, users are able to interact with and decouple that from the, uh, the underlying infrastructure um, really empowers the users to, uh, to be able to start doing a lot more things. And uh, by having all of our users be able to use OpenStack, we're, we're starting to, um, as we continue to build up our catalog of services, starting to have more and more things that they're able to, uh, to self-service and uh, provision themselves without having to, uh, to come to the data center for their, uh, for their needs. Um, you know, another, another thing with this, and, and this has been mentioned a couple times already, is, uh, you know, the... Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> he changed my sorry. slide on me. Um, just the, the investment that we've got in, uh, in our um, filer infrastructure that we've already got. So that what we're already used to, uh, to operating, um, we're able to take and uh, reuse that um, by, uh, by using the, uh, the drivers that Greg had talked a little bit about to really make it such that the users are able to request a share, but underneath the... Uh, driver is able to reuse the, uh, the existing infrastructure that we have in, uh, in WFA and the, uh, the NetApp filers that we already know how to uh, run. Um, I've touched already on kind of the self-management, the, the DevOps thing, the, the ability for users to, uh, to get what they need in order to, um, to do the work that they need to do. Um, and, uh, you know, this just really is, is allowing our users to, uh, to continue to... Um, be able to self-service things that, uh, that they're accustomed to coming to the data center for, and where we really had a disconnect between what we offered in cloud services and what we offered in uh, traditional IT, um, where they were accustomed to, uh, to being able to get things very quickly in, uh, in our private cloud, and then there's other things that took them longer in our traditional infrastructure, and by bringing some of those additional services into our, our private cloud, we're able to deliver a, a richer experience and have all those services that they're, uh, they're accustomed to or more of the services they're accustomed to in our, uh, in our private cloud. So can you share with us a, you know, a couple of more benefits? I know we've hit quite a few of these, but you know, being able to uh, you know, share with what, again, not necessarily reinvent but reuse and, and some of the self-service and bringing the traditional IT services back in to their private cloud. Yeah, no, uh, no absolutely, Greg. Um, so, you know, using the... Uh, the, the standardization for being able to, uh, to have uh, a consistent workflows that are constantly called so we're able to provision the, the same thing so we know what's, uh, what's being created out there in our, in our private cloud. Um, it, it also helps reduce some of the uh, kind of confusion that we've had as uh, we've added export permissions to our traditional NAS where the storage team might be adding you know, an IP address to a traditional NAS that we have for an export permission and then somebody else coming along can't figure out what it is. So by, by having this interface where we're, we're able to have the users interact with the, uh, the API and provision the NAS and then self-service provision the, um, the permissions as well, we, we've, we've standardized how that, uh, how that is happening. Um, again, you know, I, I've already touched on this a little bit, but uh, increasing efficiency. So we've, uh, we've made it much more 
quick and much easier for the users to, uh, to provision the resources they need as well as uh, permission the, uh, the resources they need. So if they add additional um, compute instances to what they're, they're running or they destroy and recreate and they get a different IP, they're able to, uh, to very easily interact with the Manila service change the, uh, the export permissions for their NAS, mount their, uh, their NAS up to their instances without having to, uh, to wait for, uh, for a human to, uh, to go and uh, change the export permissions on a uh, NAS share that, that exists in our traditional space. Um, Achieve fast, reliable, customized storage deployments. So I, I think I've already touched on this a little bit, but just, you know, we're now creating the, the NAS shares in a, uh, consistent, repeatable manner by having automation um, actually going out, creating the, uh, the volumes that, uh, that we're creating. Um, you know, and, and again, you know, the, the kind of some of the best practices stuff, again, you know, I think that comes down to, uh, down to consistency such that when the, the shares are created for the user, they're created in a consistent manner. We've got a little bit of uh, orchestration happening that's making some, uh, some placement decisions to, uh, to determine which, uh, which fire to, uh, to place it on, and that allows it to be done in a consistent manner. And I think the, uh, you know, the key to all of this, I mean, a lot of the technology is really cool, but I think that the key to it is really being able to provide the, the services to the, uh, the end users that are looking for this. So uh, a lot of our, our work right now in our, in our private cloud is, uh, is development, and uh, we've had a mandate for about the last year that uh, we look to cloud first for development. So anytime a, a business unit uh, wants a new system, we're really steering them to use our private cloud so that they can um, provision the resource very, very quickly. Um, but we did have, uh, have a gap in there, as I, I've already mentioned, from a, a NAS um, service because so many of our business units were accustomed to, uh, to having that, uh, that shared file system in place on their uh, servers that the data center had previously supported. And as we pushed our business units into our uh, private cloud for uh, um, the, their, their work, we had a, had a big gap in, uh, in the services. And uh, some of them were still going through our, our traditional IT requesting export permissions to, uh, to NAS that we already had. And with, uh, with that, there was kind of a lag in that occurring. So by, by delivering this, what we're able to do is we're able to allow them to much more quickly get the, uh, the resources that they need. So. Thanks, Justin. So yeah. is, it, is it fair to say that you know, with everything that you know, we spent a lot of time together working with yep. requirements and definitions, but is it fair to say that you didn't necessarily have to change your standard storage architectures and, and some of the best practices that you guys felt worked for you by when we went through this project? Is, is that still the case? You're still to yep. maintain you know, your best practices, your yep. architecture. You didn't have to redo things. It was still business as usual for the storage guys? Yeah, yep, that's, uh, that's very true. And I, I mean, I think that's just, when you, when you think about OpenStack as that abstraction, that orchestration layer, really what it lets you do is it lets you take these, these pieces of infrastructure that you may already be maintaining just beyond Manila, but in other, other services as well, and continue doing what you're already doing, but put that self-service interface in front of the users to be able to allow them to request what they need and have it provisioned in a very quick time frame. Awesome. All right. So that, um, we went through the material pretty quick. So um, just to uh, ask, are there any questions or any, anything that you all would like to ask or hear more about? I mean, we've got some time. Um, any questions? Hello. Hello. There we go. Um, what kind of workloads are you putting on Manila? Is it uh, just file sharing, traditional file sharing that um, is being used in a self-service way, or you are looking at new kind of workloads like Hadoop or things like that? No. So, so for what we're doing in our, in our private cloud on, on our NAS, it's it's primarily to support traditional workloads. So I think as we we're we're a fairly large company, we're doing a lot with our with our private cloud and also building some products that uh, that will uh, will run on the cloud, but I think as we're, we're looking at where this fits the need right now is the developers who are building traditional applications, really we had a, had a large gap because they're accustomed to doing things through um, NAS or through, through mm -hmm. shared storage, and uh, what this allowed us to do is to, to take something that they already know as they're continuing developing and testing of their, their traditional applications to, to give them the, the ability to uh, much more quickly 
go through, provision a, a NAS, mm -hmm. and do the work they need to do. But yeah, there, there's, I wouldn't say there's anything innovative that we're doing that we're running on the NAS at this point. Okay, so that, just to add to, to the answer and maybe add to your mm -hmm. question is that, remember that Manila is just a control plane, right? Yeah. So the workload is gonna be dependent upon the backend storage, mm -hmm. you know, as well as maybe how you do your neutron networking too. Yeah. So just keep that in mind as you guys go down that path. Yeah, no, uh, the, the reason I asked the question is I wanted to, because the way I think you presented is, is what I see Manila getting used as, which is a cloudy file service mm -hmm. that yeah. gives you a share when you want it. You know, when you don't want it, you get rid of it. You don't care where it came from, it's yep. all done. It's a catalog-driven thing. Yeah, very yeah. transparent to the end user who has self-management and, and the ability to self-provision. Yeah, I mean, I'd say I'll just add to that, too. Another place that we'd, we'd really seen that need is if you have, uh, have a group that's doing some work and they have a couple of compute instances, they want to have somewhere that they can very easily write that file out to for kind of a persistent storage where they can write it out and they can, they can read it in from, from other instances even when uh, the actual compute instance uh, goes away and uh, you know you could use something like object storage for that but there's not a lot of people that know how to how to write to that when you can do a you know a traditional file system I think it really fits uh, fits a need where people already know how to how to do those operations um, so for Justin you had a, a initial implementation private cloud imp implementation and you moved to OpenStack yes. what, what was what motivated you to make that change <laughs> No, that's a that's a fair question. I kind of I kind of said that. So, um, you know, without without talking too long about it, uh, we we went, we used CloudStack um, almost three years ago. We started on that path, and at that time, I wouldn't say we we knew we'd probably reevaluate it, but wasn't clear who the winner was going to be. And I would say, given the number of people here, it's pretty clear who the winner is now. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> I have a question about snapshots. You said there are read-only copies of a share, and I knew you could make a new share, a read-write share. Correct. Um, but is there an API for exporting a read-only snapshot directly? Exporting a read-only snapshot? So you got to work upon a share. So I, I can't necessarily work upon a snapshot within Manila. Uh, so I'd have to. Uh, okay, that's not because it said it was a read-only copy. So it's not yeah. even readable, really. It, but I it's can there. do it. I can do it outside of Manila, so to speak. I, if Right. You know, okay. from a storage administration perspective, you know, there's some things that could be done there. Yeah. Okay. Now, I was wondering if yeah. I missed something in the API. I didn't remember if there's any way to read a snapshot yeah. directly. And, you and can make a share can, from it. Afterwards, we can get some clarity to that to make sure I didn't misrepresent <laughs> it, and then we'll ask no, in just, a moment. Right. Okay, thanks. Hi, um, I have a real fundamental question. So, when would you use Swift as opposed to uh, a file share? Is, is one faster than the other? or? or because Swift is already available to all the VMs. I'm not. Yeah, so I'll, I think there's two answers to that. And I'll take part of it, and, and your experience yeah. would be very valuable in answer. So, yeah. you know, from my experience with customers and, and what they do with their applications, think about applications. Think about uh, an Oracle database or a MySQL database or things like that that write to file systems where they're already, you know, set up to write to file systems versus objects and things like that. Or in, in some environments that we see, where people need clustered file systems where ob you can say objects or files and, and things within that file system need to be shared. Um, one of the things that Justin mentioned too is that the ability to save that Manila share, to build it and maintain that data, you can do away with the VM and bring that to a yet another environment or even take it into another OpenStack environment too in the future. So uh, to me, uh, I come from the application space uh, and storage space, so it comes down to Many of the applications already know how to work with file shares and file systems. You know, you don't have to re-architect re or rebuild. You have applications that already know how to write to files and, and manage to that. And so this provides that uh, opportunity to enable them to be within the private cloud. Or, you know, as a service provider, too, maybe that's part of an offering that you could provide, too. But, you know, Justin's has, you know, they had some experience in what they yeah, did. Yeah, no, there. I mean, I, I think Greg, Greg really touched on it. The, it. It comes down to it's not just the technology, it's the, the people aspect so that, you know, what do the developers know how to do? So you've got, a, you know, an army of developers that have been accustomed to doing things a certain way for a long time. We've got a sizable investment in the application footprint that we already have, which knows how to write to a, to a standard file system. Um, but I, I think there's definitely places for, for both of them. Yeah, well, one more question. So are you initializing your shares through the heat templates? Or you when can. VM comes up? Okay. Yeah. So there is some, yeah, there's, um, 
I can't remember when the session was, but yes, there, we do have some integration with Heat. And, and so you could build a topology. Maybe you say, I need six VMs, 22 shares, and eight you know, yeah. block yeah. storage devices. So uh, there is some integration that's uh, out there and available for Heat. Okay. It's not released in, as an integrated part of it for Kilo, but it is available. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, Justin, you indicated that you are reusing your existing investments in NetApp yep. or OpenStack for the Manila thing. Yeah. Now, the NetApp filers or ECD streams that you're using for OpenStack, are they also servicing traditional workloads or are they are dedicated to OpenStack workloads? So, so right now, the, the NetApp filers that we have <laughs> that we're using for our, our Manila service is uh, dedicated filers. What we want to, as we continue down this path, what we want to do is we want to get to the point that we're starting to commingle the workloads right. so that we've got a large footprint of, of filers already on the, the floor. And as you have gaps, whether it's uh, you know from a capacity of space perspective or you've got some additional capacity from a performance perspective, to be able to more intelligently do some placement on the, the shares, you know, kind of to spread the, the workload out a little bit. So you know what we did initially was very specific in that uh, we've got dedicated filers, but as, as we look to, to continue down this, this path, we really want to be able to, to spread that out. So basically on the NetApp filers, uh, the ONTAP code need to be updated to service Manila or uh, the existing code would just work fine? So with I, I think, you know, Greg touched on this a little bit when he talked about that indirect versus direct model. Um, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the, the specifics of the, uh, you know, the NetApp code versions interacting with the uh, Manila direct driver, but in our implementation, because we're essentially going through the, the WFA or the right. workflow automator right. is kind of that orchestration piece. I, I don't think there's as many dependencies on certain right. versions. And I think what that allows us to do is it really allows us to to leverage something that, that NetApp has that already knows how to do the provisioning to help us make those those placement decisions. And I, Greg, I don't know if you wanted anything to that. Yeah, uh, just to let you know, we do have somewhat of a, a an interoperability type matrix. So uh, there are pieces of the cluster data on top. Uh, in Manila, they work well. Uh, for example, right now, we don't have a seven mode driver. It sounds like you're quite familiar with it. Right. And so there's not a seven mode driver. So that's an example where you know, there would be maybe a gap for you possibly, I don't know. Okay. But yeah, the, the Manila driver, the NetApp Manila driver is cluster data on top. Okay. And it's been tested with uh, 8182, uh, 8.3, kind of being recent, still going through a lot of the testing, but we know that for the most part it works. Okay. But we haven't said, yeah, you know, it's all good, or you know, we still got some more testing there okay. to do. Okay. But yeah, it's cluster data on top. Uh, I test with 8.3, but I'm not most certainly the one that goes through a lot of different use cases maybe that a customer would go through. We do know people out there are using it with 8.2 and 8.1. And then again, we don't have a seven mode driver yet. Okay. Now, do you have stats? Like I know uh, working with NetApp previously, they used to know, show, show me stats like this is how the customer adoption of, adoption of this particular code level is with with, uh, so when you say code level, is a Manila code level or on not, top? Uh, just uh, just as under like a clustered on top code level. Like, uh, do you have are, something? I mean, for I know Manila? that's available. I don't have that information okay. though. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank yeah. you. All right, guys. Well, yeah, appreciate your time, uh, and thanks for coming. Hope everyone's enjoyed the summit. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks.